Welcome to St. David's. Nice to have you today. You may be seated. It's our Remembrance Sunday, and uh, we'll be going into that uh, part of our service almost immediately. Uh, there are a few announcements uh, that we would like to make sure you're aware of. Uh, the fall tea and sale is coming. Um, it's two weeks this Saturday, so uh, I believe that's right. And uh, we hope you can come and invite others to that. Thank you to Jill for playing this morning. Appreciate that in advance. Um, the Christmas pageant, I know it's hard to, say, to hear Christmas right now, but uh, there are, uh, if you're thinking of coming along for the Christmas pageant or your children or grandchildren, it would be good to be in touch with, uh, with Amy or others in Sunday school with that so that we can begin planning appropriately for numbers. Um, Advent readings, if you're willing to do a reading from the front, it's fairly painless. And uh, if j uh, just from the where we have our candles and wreath, uh, that would be great, and it would help Monica out if you'd call the office and say you'd be willing to read in coming Advent season. Also, we've uh, uh, joined with St. Andrew's effort for the in the Syrian uh, refugees uh, project, and it has a name now. It's called Chosen C H O S N Churches Helping Our Syrian Neighbors. And uh, there's an announcement in the bulletin for there, thanks to John Mulgard for all his help in making sure that would happen. There's contact numbers. If you are interested in that, we need to hear from you so that you can become a part of that sooner rather than later. The end of the month, uh, there's a lot of things coming on November 29th, and we ask you to look at those things. We put, a, I think Monica put a, on the back of there some of the November things coming. So there's a little thing for your fridge. if. Uh, you do that with these kinds of things, please make sure you take advantage of everything that's going on here. Let us pray. Lord, as we come into this service of remembrance, we remember first of all you, all that you have done for us in Jesus Christ. As we worship you, we are mindful of all those who have gone before us, mindful of the many sacrifices in this life on our behalf. As we come to worship you, O God, we lift you up as Lord and God in Jesus' name. Amen. The introit is in Flanders Fields, which was arranged by Gordon Stockwell.
opening hymn of praise, O God, our help in ages past. 330 in the book of praise. 330.
I'll have the placing of the wreath. I know Benjamin and Tim are mentioned in the bulletin. There are others helping today, and thank you very much. Hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to have uh, an anthem, and then, uh, boys and girls, after the anthem, if you come up to the front steps, we'll have a prayer with you, and you'll go forth to your Sunday school. In remembrance, uh, I'll enter daily from the Requiem. nice when we don't fit on the steps. Come on over, it's okay. Or not, that's good, you're good, you're good, thank you. Let's, let's just say a prayer. We remember, you know, it's a quiet, just a quiet moment this morning with some different things, the, the trumpet to remind us of the military, but, uh, but also uh, to remind us uh, all that we have so much uh, in our country and uh, veterans and others have given so much and of course God through Jesus has given us life. And so we want to just bow our heads together and close our eyes. I got crickets going. Remember to turn your cell phones off. Let's pray together. You say the prayer after me, everyone, please. Dear God, thank you for being here this day. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for knowing how I am. Help me to remember all that you've done for me and for us. 
to be grateful, to look to you, Lord, for our life and hope and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Got some good stuff happening outside there for you. And I'm glad you all could be here today. Thanks again to those who helped out with the reef. Appreciate it. Let's pray together as we come to the reading of the scriptures. Lord, we ask you to help us as we read the Bible because we need to hear your word for today. We know they are ancient stories, and yet we know you can touch them right now in our lives. And so as we come to hear your word anew, help us to trust you anew for its content and application to our lives in Christ's name. Amen. Steve's coming up to help us with Ruth and Hebrews. Thank you. Good morning. The first Old Testament reading this morning is taken from the book of Ruth, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, and that would appear on page 394 of the Pew Bibles. Ruth, chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go, uncover his feet, and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. And further ahead in the book of Ruth, on page 396, we pick up the story in chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a family guardian. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. The second Old Testament reading is taken, or have we moved forward? No, it's uh, Hebrews, New Testament Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 24. That appears on page 1790 in the Pew Bibles. It's Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 to 28. I think I need my glasses. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once 
to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Turn with me to our responsive psalm, which is found page 940 of Psalm 146. We'll read responsibly there. Psalm 146 on page 940. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord watches over the foreigner, sustains the fatherless and the widow, but frustrates the ways of the wicked. Praise the Lord. And the Gospel reading is from the Gospel of Mark. And chapter 12, found on page 1512, if you'd like to read along. Mark 12 and verses 38 to 44. And as Jesus taught, he said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. But they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Amen. And may God help us to understand this, his holy word. Let us sing together the prayer of Francis of Assisi. Lord, make us servants of your peace. Number 739, 739.
Lord, as we again come to hear you, may you help us take away those distractions which would draw us away from you, draw us into your loving arms anew. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Well, we all have memories uh, around wars, or more specifically around those close to us who have served. Um, Perhaps we have served, or family members, or friends. For those who have first-hand memories, who have known the devastation of war, you know how important it is to never repeat the millions of losses, certainly through the world wars. I wonder if we will be able to not once again be plunged into such a conflict as I listen like so many of you do to the news regularly, perhaps this time in the Middle East, but who knows? Perhaps you wonder too. Those who have served know the importance of not ever going back to the huge losses and uncertainties of those days, of fighting against those who would proclaim themselves world leaders by war and not by due process. The rest of us Those who have not served in a literal battle or in a conflict or war zone have the memories of those who did leave us to do so. In my family, uh, my paternal grandfather, Arthur Dent, who I only met as a young child in the Royal Army, fought in the trenches of World War I and was permanently disabled through that conflict. My father's mother raised a family of five children. My father joined the Merchant Marine when he was underage. He returned a changed man, but he returned. My mother and my maternal grandmother both worked in factories, riveting, I think, although I've got to have to check on that. And my oldest brother joined the Navy and went to Vietnam in the 1960s during that conflict, which eventually was acknowledged as a war, and some even acknowledge it as a loss by the U.S., I'm not sure I've shared all these family connections with you over the years. It's not about me or saying that my family is more connected to the military than yours. I'm only saying that we all have some memories, whether they be of friends or of family or of close ones or of ones we have known only tangentially. We all have some memories of those who have served. My father once told me that our family has uh, used to be only farmers and military men for generations. And perhaps that's true. We all have what I call a collection of smaller and larger memories. And when I chose this sermon title, I was thinking that the smaller memories were our family members, and the larger memories are our thoughts on the millions of losses, the war themselves, preventing them and remembering them so we will not choose the same again. But probably the larger memories Inside us are our fathers and brothers and many others who were close to us and made us who we are. We turn to the the scriptures, we find the story of Ruth starts out with Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, who leaves her native land of Israel because of the famine and goes on to neighboring Moab. Moab's on the eastern shore of the Dead Sea. It probably wasn't even her decision, but her husband, Elimelech's, who said they needed to move because they were starving. But in the process of moving and settling, and to summarize the book, not only does Naomi lose her husband in the foreign land, but she also loses her two sons as well. She is full of grief to the point of bursting. But she still cares enough about others to urge her daughters-in-law to go back to their own families to try and remarry or at least have a chance at not starving with people they know. And one daughter-in-law chooses to return to her family as Naomi urges her to do. And the other one, Ruth, boldly declares that she will stay with Naomi and that Naomi's God will be her God and her people will be her people. It is a love story at many levels, and eventually they find their way home, and Ruth remarries, this time in the line of King David, giving birth to King David's grandfather, whose name is Obed. Of course, Naomi had to go through a lot, and we don't know how she managed her losses beyond her trust in God. At one point, all she asked her family to call her was Mara. Mara means bitter. 
Our losses, our lost dreams and hopes, our lost family and friends can make us bitter. We can only see how our own are no longer there for us, and we can continue in this vein for a very long time, in fact, for the rest of our lives, if we so choose. But what antidotes are there for our bitterness, whether it be due to losses or other things? The scriptures teach us that our bitterness can be combated with forgiveness, and certainly it involves forgiveness towards those who have cut off relationship with us and gone another way. It even involves forgiveness towards those who have died and left us in this life alone. They do not choose to die usually, but they are gone. And we can choose our course of action amidst our reaction to these difficulties and tragedies. We don't have a choice around their living or not, or if they have cut us off or not, but we can forgive them, which means whatever bonds or connections we have to them, we give back to the Lord. And as we do so, we can be free, or freer, at least. Literal and emotional losses have been taking place since the beginning of humanity. Imagine the loss of Adam and Eve, of their son at the hands of their other son. Our losses go back to the foundation of humanity. And God knows our losses as God knows us. And he gives us choices because he loves us. And these are choices to go on to trust again, to face the new reality of our days. In Ruth's family, it was new relationships and eventually new life that brought hope, the hope of a king, and through him the Messiah that would bless not only Israel, but all the nations of the earth. Hebrews 9 tells us that the Messiah, Jesus of Christ, went into the Holy of Holies and offered himself on our behalf that whoever would believe would have eternal life, as John says. Jesus did not go over and over into that holy place, but gave his life once for all. And when he comes again, it will be to save us all who believe, and we will have life beyond this life, new life, new relationships. And the journey will continue because Jesus fought the ultimate war on our behalf. He lost his earthly life, but won the war. And now things are not as they appear. Those with the most power and influence and financial resources are not necessarily those who shape this life. Rather, it is the least, the less significant in the world, world's eyes who are often the ones closest to God. And we note this in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, that we read, as Jesus once again takes us on a field trip with the disciples. He takes us to the temple where he notes that things are not as they appear. The religious leaders are not as they appear. The rich giving large sums of money are not as they appear, and the poor are not as they appear, such as a widow who quietly puts in the two two pennies, or its equivalent, into the offering plate. Jesus needs to help us to see, because we only see the outside and the external. But he sees that this woman has trusted God with the entirety of what she has, whereas the others are giving just a little of what they have. And while Jesus is not suggesting we come each of us to church every Sunday and empty our bank accounts, all of them, he is making the point of trusting God with all of who we are and all of our resources. So don't look at the outer circumstances, Jesus says. Look at your choices, choices for life, choices for good. And as we remember large and smaller memories on this day, let us trust our God anew to do that good which we cannot imagine on our own. Let us pray. Help us, Lord, again, as we take these solemn moments to remember that we can have joy from your hand. We can have renewed hope and a new sense of peace within as we trust you. We look to you, Lord, even as we look at the children assembled here at the front and have so much hope for them. Renew in us the hope that we have toward them. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. We 
give back uh, a portion to God and take up our offering, give our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
to see the whole of time from your perspective. But even as we come in our lives and what we do remember from our own lives, we are grateful to you at this time. And so we take a moment to offer gratitude to you. And for those uh, that we know around us, we offer uh, prayers of uh, gratitude and thanksgiving at this time. than we know ourselves. We're grateful, Lord. Grateful for our country and our freedoms. Grateful for your many mercies to us and our families. Where there are continuing disturbances and difficulties in our families, we ask you to help us to be agents of peace, of mercy, of truth, of your love. We trust you anew with our country in these days for our new Prime Minister uh, Trudeau, for the Cabinet, for all those who lead us in these days. Help us, we pray as we seek to have your best here in this country to follow your way and your will for all those who continue to serve you in the military and in many other areas of service. We ask for your blessing, your care, your mercy these days. Help them to know you, to serve out of serving you, we pray. All these things are together in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we close this service and the service around uh, just before July 1st with the uh, the two verses of O Canada and then the Ode to Newfoundland, um, all four verses. And um, so if you stand together with me, we'll uh, sing both the uh, first verse that we know. You may know some other words. Don't worry about that. They've changed the words, as you know, several times. Uh, but the O Canada words of the first verse and then the prayer that goes with that all, almighty love by thy mysterious power and wisdom guide with faith and freedom dower be ours a nation evermore the no oppression blights where justice rules from shore to shore from lake to northern lights may love alone for wrong atone lord of the lands make Canada thine own let's stand to sing <laughs>
do have a coffee time after. You know you're welcome down the stairs this way. And now may the, our, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the friendship and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.